is Manish Bapna. He's the executive vice president and managing director of the World Resources Institute, a global research organization focusing on natural resource management. Also with us is Chandra Bhushan. He is deputy director general at the Center for Science and Environment in New Delhi. Gentlemen, thanks to both of you for joining us. Chandra, let me start with you. As I just mentioned to our correspondent, India's Earth Sciences Minister has blamed climate change for this heat wave that uh, you're experiencing in India. It's killed at least 2,200 people. Now, scientists here in the United States uh, say that it's too early to make a connection between the heat wave and climate change. What is your view on that? Well, it's very difficult to make one-to-one -one relationships, but if you look at the trend for the past few years, uh, India is suffering because of extreme weather events. And all the trends indicate that there is some problem with our climate system. There are some relationships that we need not reject and that we need to study more. But there is a general feeling in India that this heat wave, heat wave was too quick, too extreme, something that we have not experienced for a long, long, long time. So I think there is a... I think it's a good, good recognition within the country that, uh, you know, that climate change is impacting us. It will prompt us to be much more alert about these issues. It will also prompt us to push ourselves and the global community to, you know, solve the problem of climate change. Manish, you have written extensively about India's energy needs and how it impacts climate change. Put that in some kind of context for us. How does India compare with, say, countries like China and the United States? So... I mean, I think a lot of people combine India, China, and the United States in the same sentence. And I think it's quite important to recognize that they're very different countries. If you look at GDP per capita, uh, India is about uh, a quarter of what it is in China and about a 20th of what it is in the United States. 60% of Indians live on less than $2 per day. And from an energy standpoint, about 300 million Indians still don't have access to modern forms of electricity. 80% of oil is imported in India. So India is at a very different kind of development pathway. And so I think the big question that India is grappling with is how do we, how do we provide energy to promote growth to tackle poverty? And the big question is can that be done in a way that's also compatible with tackling climate? And I think what we're beginning to see increasingly that the two can go hand in hand. One can tackle India's energy problems, but do so in a way that is low carbon, more uh, friendly in terms of reducing emissions uh, and tackling climate change. All right, and where does that effort go? I mean, the Prime Minister of India talked about renewable sources of energy. What is he talking about? Uh, wind energy, uh, things like that? Yeah, so uh, quite, quite significant, bold commitments he has made around both solar and wind. Today, actually, the cabinet in India's government just approved a 100 gigawatt solar target by the year 2020, 2022. Just to put that in context, the current generating capacity uh, for solar is three gigawatts in 2014, 2015. So we're talking about an over 30 fold increase in solar capacity in less than seven, eight years. Uh, we're also beginning to see a fairly significant ramp up in wind power as well. So quite, quite aggressive targets being taken by the new government. Right. Chandra, if we look at some of these specific problems in India, one of the biggest problems appears to be massive deforestation by the poor, especially, who use the wood uh, as a source of fuel. I mean, how much is that a contributing factor in the country's climate problems? I think this is the wrong information. Actually, if you look at last 10 years later, India's forest cover is actually increasing. We have a very, very stringent and some can say even a draconian forest law. Uh, about 23% of India's geographical area is forest area. And there is no evidence that the use of fuel wood by poor is contributing to deforestation or has anything to do with climate change. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, India's forests are a net sequester of carbon dioxide and not a net emitter. So I think this is, a, this is not a correct information. So what do you see then are the main factors that are driving climate change in India? I think the main factor is consumption. And uh, as uh, you know, uh, it has been explained that energy consumption is going to increase in India. Uh, despite India having such an ambitious goal on renewable energy, I believe that India will continue to use coal for medium term and have some amount to, uh, and have dependence on fossil fuel uh, like gas and oil for transport and industrial sector. So uh, I think 
there are huge co-benefit agenda that is there for the country, including in energy sector, transport sector, uh, industrial sector. And I think India has to adopt those co-benefit agenda in its development plan. We have this uh, so-called now uh, 12th five-year plan was to be a low carbon plan. I'm not sure whether the 12th five-year plan exists uh, with this government. But anyway, I, I think we have huge, uh, you know, both development benefit, climate de benefit, and environmental benefit uh, in going low carbon. And I think that's what India should be doing. Manish, when we look at the current heat wave in India, which, as I mentioned, has claimed the lives of at least 2,200 people, why has this particular heat wave been so deadly? I think it's been both the sudden onset of the heat wave after a fairly cool temperature in the earlier part of the month and the and also quite importantly the prolonged duration of the heat wave. So we had about about five degrees Celsius higher than typical average temperatures. Uh, but it's also quite important to know that the vulnerability of people uh, to a particular event is in part how severe the event is, but it's also in part the adaptive capacity. Uh, of the individual, of the household, of the, of the state government, of companies, how they react to the heat wave. And so what, one of the interesting things about this heat wave is you had certain places in India where a lot of people died and other places which had the same similar levels of heat where fewer people died. They were better prepared. And so how we actually can also ensure greater preparedness for these types of extreme events, which will happen more often in the future with a warming climate, is an important part of the important part of the conversation. Right. When you say better prepared, are these places where people had access to, say, clean water, where they have these cooling centers, which have been established in some cities? A lot of it is just um, you know you look at uh, Odisha or Gujarat, other states where there were fewer people that died compared to let's say Andhra Pradesh, where a lot of people died. Uh, there were government uh, instructions about outside laborers should not be working between 11 and 3. Uh, health clinics were given sufficient ice slabs, so if people came in with potential heat exhaustion symptoms, they knew exactly what to do. So there were actual instructions given by government to health clinics for people that were working outside, for other people that were vulnerable, to make sure that they could get adequate, timely treatment, which was let not the case in other places in India. Chandra, what kind of impact has the heat wave had in India, not just on, on you know people, but on things like food supplies, on the environment. We understand that in India, 17 million chickens perished in this heat wave. That must put pressure on food supply, on the food, must put pressure on prices as well, of course. And of course, there's a possibility now for drought with this lighter monsoon. Yes, I think uh, this, these are worrying times for the country. Uh, the heat wave had, uh, as Manish said, a significant impact in certain part of the country. Uh, but, you know, uh, the impact on the poultry industry is actually quite common. Every summer we do see uh, these kind of impact on the poultry industry. In fact, the industry uh, goes into, you know, some sort of depression every summer. But uh, uh, I believe that uh, the good thing about this heat wave, uh, if, if I can say so, was that it has prompted the government to reopen the debate on public warning system for heat waves. You know, we, we had an excellent system uh, even 20 years back where, you know, there was a public announcement, water, medicine, everything was provided during, during extreme heat period. Somehow, uh, government withdrew from that process. But now there is a general recognition that, uh, you know, we need to bring back a lot of practices, uh, good practices that we had in the past. And, uh, uh, and, and those practices are coming ba back, which is going to in fact, you know, warn people beforehand uh, with the kind of impact that is going to happen. But as far as, uh, as I see future from now, I think India needs to s step up its efforts towards setting up better monitoring, prediction, and warning system, not only for heat wave, but also for extreme rainfall events, floods, and droughts. And this drought is going to be a challenge for our meteorological department, uh, because uh, there is a general sense that uh, the country agriculture sector is going to suffer a lot because of onset of El Nino and uh, less monsoon that the country is going to get, less rainfall that the country is going to get this year. Manish, we hear Chandra, they're talking about monitoring systems. There's an official mm -hmm. of the Red Cross in India who said that much of the mortality that we've seen during this current heat wave was preventable, mm -hmm. uh, that there need not have been so many people who have died. I mean, what needed to have happened then? I mean, I think, I think what Chandra has said around the early warning systems is absolutely crucial. Just getting in place 
a clear set of instructions about what to do when these things happen. And I want to come back to your first question about are we going to see more of this mm -hmm. actually taking place? And I think the uh, with with the warming climate, uh, we will we'll see more extreme heat events. We will see changes in the monsoon patterns. Uh, we will see sea level rise take place. One of the things, it may be difficult to attribute any single event to climate change, but I like using the analogy of an American uh, sports baseball, mm -hmm. right? And there was a scandal, you know, about a few years ago about baseball players using steroids. You would know when a baseball player hit a home run, you wouldn't know if it was attributable to the steroids, but you knew the steroids increased the likelihood of hitting a home run. In some sense, that's how climate change acts vis-a-vis -vis these extreme events. They make these extreme events much more likely. And so making sure we have those early preparation systems is absolutely crucial. That's where we are going to have to take a break. Chandra Bhushan in New Delhi, thanks for joining us. Manish Bhatta, you stay with us right now. We are going to take a break. When we come back, global greenhouse gas emissions passed a crucial threshold in March. What does it mean for the world? That's next. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.